so as a way of starting this out, um, and I'm just going to check in and how are you doing, Gabelo, um, Joseph, and Mulemo? So maybe we can start with you, Joseph, as um, sort of the first director. Um, how are you at this current moment, both professionally, personally? Um, and yeah, just sort of like take us forward. <laughs> how would you like to start? Um, I hope that the next round of questions, I'll be the last, if I'm the <laughs> first for the first round. <laughs> I hate starting. Um, yeah, um, I mean, when all of this was starting to become kind of evident in late February, um, my counterpart in Shanghai, um, in the job that I'm in now, um, said, so she, of course, had experienced everything already um, and during the course of um, January and February in China. She had two really important pieces of advice. One was to go to the dentist, um, <laughs> and the other was to um, stay off social media. Um, <laughs> I managed to do the first, um, but haven't been altogether <laughs> successful with the second. The, have largely, I think, managed to stay away from the more sort of toxic ends of um, what social media can offer, um, but have been aware of needing to do a lot of filtering during this period, a lot of filtering out of things, um, and yeah, trying to maintain a sense of what is, um, what seems to be important or significant. Um, and uh, it's a, m a moment where the possibility of intense distraction is, is hugely amplified. Um, <clears throat> been struck by the ways in which space opens up to do things that, to, to do things that weren't necessarily possible to do previously. Um, thinking about conversations with people, conversations within the organization that, that I work in, the, possibility to move quite fast and uh, affect things that at an earlier point might have taken three or five or six months suddenly become possible within a few days. Um, so that's been, I think, quite a, a, a kind of interesting special aspect of the moment. Um, um, within the general kind of disorientation, um, I think it is um, that there's obviously a kind of huge amplifying and clarifying of a whole set of underlying problems and issues generally, globally, um, um, nationally, locally, um, sort of down at kind of every, every layer um, that one, one becomes more acutely conscious of and aware of. Um, I think, and within that, I mean, I, uh, important things that I've been very f acutely aware of and grateful to have a job that is more or less pandemic proof, at least for the moment, touch wood, um, and a garden, um, which has been great. Um, and also at the same time, being mindful of the fact that probably the most significant thinking and practice at this moment is going to come from those in a more precarious and urgent position than myself. Um, so I've also found myself being in more of a listening mode, which is the mode that I'll now sh shift to as I throw the ball to Molemo. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Joseph. Um, maybe just to start off to say thank you, Ruby Lewis, for bringing us together. Um, I don't think we've ever had the opportunity to have this kind of conversation. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think sometimes times like this just enable things that maybe don't immediately um, occur to us in normal times. Um, how am I doing? I am doing okay. Um, I think in the, in, the, in the early period, sort of late February, early March, I was in a bit of a panic um, and a kind of general sense of anxiety. Uh, which was as much about 
not being able to do anything about what was happening as it was about not really knowing what was happening. Um, and I think um, things have become a little bit, we've gotten into a bit of a groove of not doing anything mm. <laughs> um, now and kind of letting things play out and maybe also just sort of um, trusting the process a little bit. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm a freelancer now. Uh, a lot of my work for sort of May, June has been canceled um, because of COVID-19. So there is, of course, this kind of um, lack of clarity about the rest of this year, um, sort of watching announcements, watching the state of change from level four to three to two to one uh, and what impact that might have on, on me. Um, but also in terms of sort of international connections and how other countries are changing. Um, so at the moment, I think things feel okay, but there is definitely a sense of not really knowing what comes next. Um, and kind of when, what is the stage at which we should panic? Um, and that's just at a kind of more sort of career level, but it's also perhaps at a health level. Um, and being very aware, like I think many of us are of ourselves or our family members who might be at significant risk and the fact that things are probably going to change quite a lot now with the loosening of the lockdown. Um, so yeah, I think in a, in a general space of contemplation, but also I think a lot of possibility and really thinking about what this time potentially offers us for new ways of thinking when we are finally allowed out. Yeah, throwing over the ball to Gabriela. Uh, thanks, Rufime. Um and everybody who came to listen to us. Um, it's been kind of, uh, I guess, uh, difficult because like Mulem, I'm also working freelance and um, the work that I've been doing has involved uh, travel. Um, and so I guess I was affected by COVID a bit earlier than when things were closing down here. So things were already postponed for me in January um, when it was hitting China and Hong Kong, um, which is where some of the work I was doing, uh, I am doing is going to be. So it's, I've kind of had like, I guess a different, like two different waves of it. Uh, one, like at a more personal level, which is when the lockdown happened at home. And in terms of professionally, it was earlier when uh, different um, borders were being closed. And I guess it's also been initially when most uh, countries were not sure of their response to it. It was a postponement and a kind of like the requirement to juggle things. So things were shifting from um, think about ways where you can have the thing that you want, but with less people. So say the before it was like an official postponement, one had to kind of like rethink um, their projects to kind of like try and fit um, the, what was happening. And so when it was finally locked down here, I was exhausted because already it was like, I had to like rethink a few things and when everybody went online, I mean, honestly, I haven't really engaged the many things that have been online because I was just tired. Um, so, yeah, but in a sense, I think the, I guess it's not uh, interesting in, in, in the sense of what creatives are doing during this time, but rather to think about our work and how it fits in with the rest of the world and with it, with, within um, all the industries. So not to think of ourselves. I think we've been quite um, working in a very soul, I mean, silo and um, way where we haven't thought about, well, I hadn't at least thought about international travel and what that could do to my work. You know, it was something that was there, but I never actually like really thought about those kind of questions. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so, you've all sort of mentioned um, part of these kind of challenges and this moment 
sort of illuminating a lot of what those challenges are and look like and sort of like really expanding them. Um, and a lot of the work that you've done um, as previous directors of Banzo was really trying to think about the long term, um, or at least the way I'm seeing it now in my position, <laughs> being able to sort of look back on the work that has been done is really like this point of thinking about, well, actually, how do we cushion ourselves, right? Like, how do we ensure that even in whatever precarity that exists, there's still some ways and of, of, of support. Um, and that support can look like the different sectors um, and linking up with different sectors, as Gabelo sort of alluded to. Um, so maybe you can sort of touch a little bit on that. And, and Joseph, I will ask you, because I do want to do a sort of like chronological um, like review in a sense, right? Because I think a lot of the work that you did with like artists resale, right? we're starting to see the implementation of what that could look like right now. Um, and that was years ago. So I think that it's also important to understand how that sort of policy trajectory works. So maybe you could start us off. Okay. Um, I, think, I think from the time that I was director, I think one of the, um, or, and when I was involved in the early stages, al along with a range of other people, um, including, I see Zaid is here, Kwesi is here as well. Um, and I think that there was, that one of the, the moments at which the agenda Vanza kind of started to, for me at least, crystallize and clarify was really around this very, very simple thing of sharing information, of sharing knowledge, um, and making it accessible, making it relatively accessible to people, notwithstanding the larger issues around the digital divide and so on. Um, so I think one of the first, uh, or one of the ways in which the organization, I think, started to really um, build a kind of base for itself was around this quite quite simple thing of sharing information and knowledge about opportunities, things going on in the field, and so on. So that was one of the first clear agendas that I think um, was important to crystallize and animate. The second one, um, which is always, which has been something close, kind of close to my my heart and 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 longstanding interests is kind of research, um, um, pointing in different directions, among them towards policy, but re research that would provide a kind of evidence able to argue and take positions and advance the interests of the field more broadly. So something that struck me generally when I was working in sort of broadly in the cultural field in, in the early 2000s was to approach the state with one of two postures. The one posture was the posture of complaint and demand. Um, um, and the other, well, the, the one posture was the posture of complaint and the other posture was the posture of um, demand. Um, and I think that the way in which we sought to build a kind of knowledge base and a research base within the organization helped to position Vanza as um, a kind of relatively, uh, I think, kind of informed uh, potential partner um, that was able to um, speak a language um, where we were able to engage the state in a kind of more or less productive or constructive way. Um, while at the same time maintaining an independence and, or, and an autonomy and a critical distance. Um, and for me, it 
Plus Quadimponi and on the other hand, kind of are in, in, a, in, in this um, mode of, of complaining. Um, the, the third thing that for me was important during that period was to use that base established with those first in which we could start to support alternative ways of working and thinking and practicing the contemporary visual arts that would move outside of a way or beyond um, outside of the traditional artist gallery model on the one hand and the culture and development model on the other. Um, and where one sought to gather resources together that could support new kinds of new ways of um, connecting, or not necessarily entirely new ways, but more or less novel and context specific ways of connecting visual arts practice to the wider society. Um, so for me, a project like the, the project that we did in small towns was a, um, was a, a, a small but significant subsequently in, in Cosmo City and in, in other contexts was all, were, were also examples of this kind of direction uh, within the organization. And the final thing was really a kind of agenda around reconnecting the field within the country to the wider field on the continent. So in the wake of a long history of disconnection of the South African visual arts field from the field in the region and the rest curators and so on, working on the rest of the continent was an early and very fundamental agenda of the organization. So that's just a bit of a reflection on what was important at that time and, and maybe to, to, to pass on to Molemo. Um, so I think um, the way I understand sort of the trajectory of how Vance has worked is that it's always been quite um, pragmatic and responded to the field and kind of what works and what doesn't. Um, and, and being someone who wasn't there at the beginning when it was first initiated, um, my kind of understanding of uh, how it's changed over time is that initially when Vance was started, there was um, quite specific ideas of what it would be. Um, and the sense I get, gather is that um, the idea would be of quite a sort of broad scale national organization with kind of provincial representation and sort of large network of um, sort of tiered representation of the visual arts. Um, and that that role that would be played would be almost union like um, in, in a way, sort of um, adopting some sort of union style structures. Um, but also doing things like providing health health insurance, perhaps, or um, other kinds of insurance, um, kind of potentially being um, a coordinating point that might be able to pool resources in ways that would enable would enable artists to access certain kinds of social services. Um, and um, how I see kind of my time, or, or how I see Joseph's time is kind of trying to test some of those things out and working out which ones work and which ones don't. Um, and Vance are quite sort of organically shifting into a space of what's really viable. Um, so artists are, I, I really do believe, um, as cheesy as it might be, sort of trying to, to organize artists is like herding cats. Um, artists do operate in quite sort of independent, individual ways. It's quite difficult to get them all in the same place and on the same page. And I think that sort of initial union sort of format was always going to be really difficult. And so its organizational structure started to change. But then also looking at sort of what financially was viable, the extent to which members were really able to financially contribute, um, what 
what sorts of services were possible with limited um, funds, uh, what kinds of finance were possible to fundraise for what kinds of projects. So by the time I arrive at Vansa, I think there's already quite a substantial kind of structure to Vansa and what Vansa offers. Um, and quite a clear understanding of, of what it can be and what it does. Um, and uh, a lot of that has kind of emerged quite organically from, from trial and error and then really being quite smart about um, the vision of some of the things that Joseph's already mentioned around um, enabling sort of space for other kinds of practice, connecting to the African continent, and definitely that the information space, um, as well as things like the internship programs and things like that. Um, so those are all relatively well established by the time I arrived um, and part of my the initial part of my time was trying to sort of formalize a lot of what had happened organically um, we changed the constitution we kind of structured um, the the provincial bodies um, which had kind of withered away more clearly we um, got the board kind of a little bit more formal and, and more organized so trying to put things that Joseph had tested out and had kind of had to sort of I don't know, pioneer in a way, um, putting those things into, into sort of um, clearer structures. And as you mentioned, um, what tends to happen is that a lot of the stuff that is initiated maybe five years before, five years later starts to um, sort of harness and formalize, particularly in engagements with government, um, takes them quite a long time for things to really start to operate. Um, and so like this sort of maintaining a relationship um, with government in terms of our advocacy strategy, I think is quite original, not original, it's quite unique in the um, in the broader art scene, like cross disciplines. Um, I think Vance's approach is quite different to what a lot of other um, arts organizations have taken. Um, but the other thing that I think is quite special about Vance um, and something that I always deeply appreciated was that Vance has quite a unique ability within the visual art space to span a very broad spectrum of types of art, arts practitioners, types of organizations. Um, so, so we were working with, say, your kind of high level galleries like um, Goodman and Stevenson and those kinds of spaces. Um, but we were also working with really tiny CPOs in really small towns and villages. Um, mm -hmm. And there's, there's, I don't know that there's another organization within the visual arts that is able to, to try and connect across that sort of space and try to represent the needs and interests across that space. Um, and particularly because Vance is a really small organization with actually quite a small budget. Um, often when I would meet people, and particularly internationally, who had heard of Vance before, um, on the continent or, or beyond, they would always assume there was a team of like 30 or 40 people. Um, and when you told them, mm, more like four, five, <laughs> uh, they'd be <laughs> amazed. Um, and I think, and, and, and you also often meet people who think that Vansa is government, is like a government agency and is funded um, by government. Like I, I met people who were quite familiar with how these things work, work and thought we were the same as sort of Barca, who get, I think, a five million rand mm -hmm. budget from government every year um, and having to explain, no, not at all. Everything is fundraised. Um, everything needs to be pieced together. And most of our funds are only sort of one year at a time and you know we're having to apply every year um and when you know that kind of precarity and that kind of workload and the limitations of capacity that that creates um and i think it was bandi legumbi who was the chairperson of the board at the time who explained to who um, and who had worked um i think she was the first employee ever of vansa years and years before um oh. and she had said to me that the the approach of vansa is because it's a small organization with limited funds and limited capacity, the approach has to be trying to put in place systemic change. Um, mm -hmm. We can't respond very quickly to immediate issues. Um, we can't do sort of immediate large scale change. Um, so we need to work very slowly and very carefully on the, on the systemic, systemic kind of um, structural stuff. And, and I think that often was um, Vance's approach is sort of putting in projects, advocating for processes, um, that understood like a longer term trajectory, but also understood that there are kind of certain systemic issues that can be adjusted, that can be changed, that would make significant differences um, to the industry of time um, and trying to keep that kind of overview and trying to keep that overview also in terms of the very different needs that different aspects of the sector needs. Yeah, that's it.
Yeah. And then Kabalo? Um, I mean, my time in Banza is more like a summer fling. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think what struck me about Banza was that the work that was put in was not visible unless you were working in it. So I found that very kind of like, um, like one hard to actually like the understanding of even like things like policy uh, and the involvement of artists and uh, practitioners. Um, and that also that Vanza, as Molemo said, worked for kind of like everyone, which is a one, uh, a huge responsibility to kind of like speak for the artists working, the old artists working in a village uh, to, I don't know, um, a, a gallery or, you know, and essentially as an organization that worked in this way, it also has great potential to kind of, it's not working for everyone at the same time, but what it does is actually, um, a kind of cascading, it cascades, there are ripple effects. So if one person that Vanza is responding to at that particular moment, that has an effect on the other person that might not be directly um, kind of affected by whatever project. So, um, I mean, I guess for me, it was the, like an opportunity to see what, the, what Vanza was doing and what the industry needs. Um, it definitely needs, well, more people <laughs> working at Vanza, um, more money. And because it's, I think it's, it's a very important institution because it responds to things that when you are practicing, you don't have time to think about, you know, or you can't do them on your own. Mm. And I'm just thinking now that, well, what was difficult also was that because the the audience or is is very broad, the question of what kind of like pace and language was something that struck me was like it's very difficult to kind of like have a, a consistent um, language, um, and I was also aware that like as an institution that is operating from Joburg, we have a particular way of speaking, of understanding art, that somehow not necessarily gets lost in translation, but it's, it, it's hard to kind of like be able to do a similar kind of um, way of speaking throughout. Mm. And which is a, it's a difficult thing, but also an important thing because it means that Vanza is aware of all of these dynamics. Um, you know, that the, the, the old people who are working in arts in Newcastle um, versus, I don't know, a young person working in Joburg have similar needs, uh, albeit using a different language to, to articulate them. So, yeah. So I think that sort of like brings us to this moment, right? Um, where Vanza is at this, in this position of um, sort of thinking long-term, um, but caught up in the reality of this very urgent moment. And I think that COVID has really um, shown us how urgent um, things like food, things like just basic resources um, beyond getting to a point of like, how do I actually exhibit my work? What does exhibition making look like in this moment, et cetera? And, and, and across the different levels as we open up. Um, so Malimo, because you had touched on it um, around sort of like Bandile's response to you um, in terms of Vanza's positioning, um, maybe you could speak a little bit to this because I think it is a challenge. How do we deal with the urgency and immediacy of this moment, um, but also have a very sort of reflexive um, and, and forward-looking approach? And holding all of these different stakeholders, right? Like the, the artists in Newcastle, the ones in Joburg. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
Um, I, I'll start off by saying I do not envy you, if you look. Um, <laughs> I don't think any of us do. Um, because it, it is definitely um, a moment that I think calls on Vanta in ways that um, maybe uh, historically haven't been quite as um, stark. Um, I think uh, Gabriela's point about how much work, how much of the work Vanta does is invisible is a very good point. Um, and I think uh, one of the very invisible things that Vanta does is these like constant, really boring, dreary government meetings, um, sitting with uh, the Minister of Arts and Culture um, and trying to work through um, all, all sorts of issues. And historically, that's been more around sort of policy stuff. Um, but right now, I believe, is is also about um, the, the, the sort of ministerial response to, to COVID-19. Um, and I think that um, another big thing that people don't really have a good sense of, of Vanta doing is, is Vanta working across these various disciplines. So working with organizations in film, working with organizations in theater, working with organizations in you know, various different disciplines, um, and the extent to which that enables um, a kind of cross-sector voice and trying to um, create stronger sort of cross-sector positions. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, I think that the challenge of COVID-19, which I think Joseph pointed to, is that it really speaks to absolute like structural inequalities and limitations um, that an organization of four people can't fix, right? Um, and so there does need to be a coordinated response and um, our sort of ministry does need a lot of support and help to develop the kind of response that's best going to suit our needs. Um, and so for the, for the most immediate issues and the most immediate responses, they're just some key things that, um, you know, our industry is being kind of overlooked in certain ways that industries, that, that organizations like Vansa need to sort of um, um, impact. So, for example, the idea that in principle we only open up um, at level one, um, which is when October maybe, um, is, is, is impossible, right? And, and part of the reason they're thinking of only opening us up at level one is because um, they think of us as like concerts and um, theater performances and cinemas, which have like lots and lots of people in them. They don't think of artists in studios, which is actually just one person who doesn't necessarily increase the, the chance of infection. So the kind of being able to communicate our, our sector to um, government is one of the key things that I think Vansa can do in a way that sort of responding about food issues is not something we can immediately re react to. And I think one of the limitations that um, we often have in our sector is that we think we're separate to everybody else. Mm. Um, so another role that Vansa plays is in ensuring that we become part of some of the broader conversations. So there's a big conversation happening at the moment about freelancers and sole proprietors. Um, and the conversation is thinking much more about sole proprietors for people like plumbers um, who may not have businesses that can apply for UIF, but they're not necessarily thinking of artists, but actually artists and plumbers are quite similar when it comes to COVID-19 support. Um, and we, and, and organizations like Vansa need to be able to voice that and clarify that and ensure that we're included in some of those kinds of dynamics and those kinds of issues. And, and I think also help as artists understand that we we need to fit into a lot of the broader systems um, and we need to stake our own claim from a lot of the broader systems. So you have a lot of artists saying DAC must give artists money um, rather than understanding how is DAC ensuring that the money that is going to individuals is definitely going to include us. You know? um, so so, so I, I think inevitably Vanta has to continue to respond in, respond in systemic ways. Mm. Um, Vance is not going to start handing out money to artists, um, but there are smart things that can be done within the, the existing sort of systemic responses that I think are Vance's responsibility. On the other side of that, I think COVID-19, and maybe we can talk about this a bit more, is potentially an opportunity for artists to also have a better sense of what Vance has been doing and the kinds of steps Vance has taken to try and already put in place some of the things that should enable artists to be more resilient in a time like this. Um, and that, um, as Gabriela says, often fans is thinking about the things that artists don't have the chance to think about. Um, and now that artists are forced to think about this, um, is there a way that we can, we can get more, more of a groundswell behind Vansa and more of the sector um, supporting and getting involved with Vansa to ensure that these kinds of systemic responses towards resilience are, are ramped up um, in this time, but also after this time? So. I wonder if 
um, Joseph, you can also respond to sort of like this current moment, the challenges and opportunities, but also contextualize it within the form of like, well, how do we do that work, right? Like, how do we, how do we get together, do that kind of educational work that needs to happen on a governmental level and at the di different levels of government as well, right? Um, around understanding what the arts actually is, but also with artists and being like, well, actually, to Monlimo's point, like, how are you going to get UIF? Like, how are you at a club actually like similar, right? Um, and then also broadly community and public um, and really building up audiences and what audiences look like mm -hmm. in this moment and also going forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, those, are, those, those are already they're, they're kind of big questions. Um, the... <clears throat> A couple of small thoughts in response to the big questions. Um, the one I think is around, and I mean, I think this kind of moment where where you have, I mean, there's this saying, I think just the, the um, former mayor of Chicago, Rom Manuel made it famous, never let a serious crisis go to waste. Um, and so there's a question about what, what, where there could be in this moment opportunities for what are perhaps long overdue, um, for want of a better word, systemic changes that would need to happen. So one of the ones that in a, in a separate conversation we've also been speaking about is really this need to move the center of gravity of where the state engages with the arts from a national level to a local level. Um, so to see how does one build um, a kind of compact between, and if there's ever a moment where it becomes clear why governments are important, it's these moments. So the, the whole notion that some people have that government is irrelevant, that it's actually the problem, not the solution. I think these moments really make clear exactly how wrongheaded and, and uh, kind of indulgent that kind of thinking is. So, but the question is what kind of government do we want and how do we want it to work? So for me, like one of the interesting possibilities to really try and push and explore in this moment where the state has to respond quite fast uh, and quite precisely or one would hope it would be it would be responding quite fast and quite precisely to see if there are instruments and measures that can be put in place now in response to this particular crisis that then have a um, have the possibility to have a life beyond it as well. So to seed things now that can actually have a kind of medium and long-term benefit. Um, so how does one devolve? At the moment, we have this completely inverted pyramid of where funding and resources currently sit, which is overwhelmingly at a national level. Mm -hmm. um, in the public sector rather than the private sector, contrary to popular belief, the vast majority of the available grant funding and available resources are in fact in the public sector. And, and the majority of that money, I, don't, I can't remember the exact figures, but you're looking at at least like 70% of it is located at the national level. So there's a question about how do you do, particularly in a, in a situation like this, how do you get money down to individual artists? That, that's what this moment really, it's the it, a kind of very stark, very simple question that the moment asks of the state. Um, so I think coming up with, um, not with perfect answer or perfect s solutions or instruments that respond to that particular, need, um, that seems to me an uh, area where an organization like Vanza could, could play a really useful and important role and a role that then actually could have a very uh, significant yield and 
benefit um, beyond the crisis that we're in currently. Um, I think your your just also from our other conversations, it's very clear that Vans is not trying to position itself as a con itself a conduit for for large um, quantities of money through the state, and I think that's a very like good. position to take and I could I think it could be deathly to the organization if it were to become that kind of conduit um, but it's seeing how does one use the existing and underutilized instruments of the state like the National Arts Council like the National Film and Video Foundation like the National Heritage Council make them work much much harder um, resource them properly um, see um, how they can how they can adapt and change their ways of working in ways that can rapidly get money that is related on the one hand to the relief compensation agenda down to individuals and organizations and on the other hand be able to be able to advance a medium and longer term agenda around resilience um, organizational and individual resilience and sustainer um. So looking sort of towards then the medium and long term, um, Gabelo, I'm going to look to you and because you mentioned languaging, right? And I'm wondering about like, what is the language that we're going to have to develop, right? What are these new ways of being um, and what are the muscles that we're going to need to work? Um, and invigorate in order to not only get past this moment, but to really thrive um, in whatever that next space looks like. I mean, <laughs> thriving is nice. Um, <laughs> it was supposed to be this year. It was supposed to be the year of 20, <laughs> plenty. <laughs> plenty, plenty. I know, <laughs> such a joke, no? Um, I think the the one thing that this moment is kind of uh, showing, um, particularly because of lack of access to each other um, in kind of like physical ways, um, most of say the rural areas, like there's a reliance on a kind of like physical contact. And so at this moment, how does, like, how do we, as uh, a sector, one, be in solidarity with each other, and two, kind of like see what our different needs are at like kind of different levels. And for me, the, it's, it's a question of not necessarily Vanza's work of creating this language, but the work of, um, of, it, of, of practitioners. Mm -hmm. um, so what I've, kind of noticed, which of course I didn't notice before working at Vanza, is how people throw challenges at Vanza, you know, to resolve. You know, this is happening. You, Vanza, fix it. And I mean, it's true that Vanza, because of the numbers, has, uh, I guess, um, a better sense of what's happening. But we also need to activate Vanza we need to like participate like actively in what Vanza is doing. And that is how, um, or what I've seen in terms of lobbying as well, is how other sectors are able to move faster is because they actively participate um, as practitioners in lobbying of government. You know, there isn't like waiting for Vanza to do all of the work. And when it gets to like parliament level, you know, it's, there's, there's so much work that we should be coming to Vanza with as well, saying like, I have these resources, I have this information, I have whatever, um, that would definitely make it easier for things to happen, um, I think, for all of us, rather than a heavy reliance on, on, on Vanza. You know, so that would be my, I think that now is the moment to realize that we can't work in silos and mm -hmm. those that have um, like 
that have the the air of government are those that have been able to organize better. And if if we can't think that we as a sector we are like all working, yes, individually our practices are different, but the the systematic things are. Systemic things are actually not on individual practice. Um, so we're coming close to the hour mark um, when we're going to start opening it up to the um, to everybody to just have like a broader conversation. But um, Marimo, because um, in a previous conversation, so uh, as we were coming into this conversation, we had like a few uh, discussions. And you had mentioned um, something that's struck me and, and it's still sort of like staying with me, right? That the solutions are really going to come from the community. Like they're going to come from the visual arts community, from the creative community. Um, and it's gonna be a sort of like emergent strategy. And I'm really, I, I found that like so profound because it will, um, that's gonna take time. And maybe part of our work is really to ensure that when that happens, the infrastructure is in place to ensure that, um, you know, we do have all of the support that we need for that to happen. But I just wanted you to sort of speak a little bit to that as we think about sort of forward looking um, and then collectively what it is that we can do together. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I think the conversation, if I remember correctly, came up um, in response to uh, uh, digitization and, and kind of online sharing of art and stuff um, and and my feeling had been that um, the kind of beginning of lockdown not just in South Africa but all over the world uh, everybody's kind of panicked and said we need to keep making art showing art and everybody just jumped online um, and there was this idea that everything needs to go online so you have these um, art exhibitions that are opening and having exhibitions um, either on social media or through web formats and um, online concerts and all this kind of thing. Um, and in many cases, it's ended up in, on, in being sort of free online content. Very little of it is monetized. Very little, little of it is sustainable. Very little of it is particularly high quality or particularly interesting. Um, and, I, and I was just saying that I think that come, came from like an initial panic um, but that we are slowly going to find ways to um, move move online in ways that um, that suit us better and serve us better um, than than simply just putting pictures on Instagram or whatever. Um, and and I think the people who are going to do that are the people who already work in the industry, who maybe have already been working to some degree online. Um, there isn't much point in an organization like Vansa trying to necessarily solve all the problems, but rather um, enable the facilitation that when solutions do emerge, they are um, supported and that there's a kind of environment in which they can thrive. Um, but the, I mean, the, the best way to do what we need to do is not going to come from the Department of Arts and Culture. It's not going to come from Suru Ramaphosa. It's not going to come from Vansa. Mm. Not that that's an order, um, but it's going to come from from artists themselves, um, who who are the ones with the imagination, the practice, the experience, um, and the experimentation to find the answers. Um, and the there's, the question is whether we've enabled a space where that can can happen, um, and and how to do that best. I think that's the that's really the million dollar question. Mm. Thank you. So, I mean, in, in that respect, then, i um, going to open it up. So our first question um, had come from Kwezi, and um, he says, I think the question that this COVID-19 crisis raises is around what kind of infrastructure is required in order to make the art industry less dependent on precarious funding, towards a more sustainable environment. Being able to answer this question now will become even more important going forward. So I don't know if any of you have any sort of comments towards that or response. Yeah, I, I do maybe. Um, I mean, I think that there are often many moving pieces with these kinds of issues but for example um a couple of years ago maybe three or four years ago uh the 
Department of Trade and Industry? No, I can't remember which department. The department that controls the lottery fund um, decided to change the bill that manages the lottery fund. Um, and they were changing the bill because the lottery fund wasn't working and there were key things that were sort of legislatively problematic and they needed to change those. Mm. And in the process of changing those, um, some of the staff members in the Department of Trade and Industry who were kind of involved in the changing of the bill added in some additional stuff. One of which was they wanted to reduce the amount of funding to the arts um, and then and hand it over to sport and they wanted to um, reduce the ability for arts to um, apply for funding for more than one year at a time, so multi-year funding. Um, and um, as is the usual procedure, they had a consultation meeting. Um, and um, in the consultation meeting, there weren't so many arts organizations. Um, I was among just a few. And um, so we kind of prepared beforehand and asking them questions like, on what basis have you reduced, have you proposed the reduction of money to arts by this percentage? On what basis have you reduced um, the multi-year to single year kind of strategy? Um, and there was, there was very little sort of thought behind that. Um, and the fact that we had sort of numbers around how much funding goes to the arts versus other things um, at a commercial level, at a state level, et cetera, et cetera. The fact that we had numbers around the kinds of funding that arts organizations have access to um, meant that we were able to kind of argue against a lot of those suggestions um, or a lot of those proposals. In the end, we didn't win the one about reducing the amount of funding. They, they still reduced the amount of funding, but they didn't um, reduce the idea of multi-year funding. Um, and, and I think it speaks to kind of um, quite limited spaces for us to really engage with government when they tried to make new decisions that they kind of stuck out of their thumbs. Um, but that, but it also points to kind of um, how a lot of these things are multifaceted. So, so Joseph was talking about research and, and recognizing the need for research in Vansa um, and Vansa's role in research um, and how, how having that kind of data and statistical information really supports um, decision-making around, around financing. Um, but that Vansa has also attempted to work with kind of new strategies um, and a number of people are talking about um, needing to rethink how funding, um, Joseph's spoken about the sort of national funding to, to slightly more localized, but there's also issues around what is the role of the National Department of Arts and Culture in giving funding like MGE when they already have something like the National Arts Council. Mm -hmm. um, why are they doubling efforts and therefore doubling the resources it requires to get that money out? Um, so I, yeah, I agree with Kwesi that there's a lot of potential to try and um, make changes during this COVID time that are not just about responding to COVID, but that can have longer term implications that, that we fix stuff that we've always known was a bit broken. I also, can I also respond to that or Cabello? Um, I just wanted to also add actually to the question, not necessarily respond, but rather that the, the way we've spoken are, around art is kind of like on numbers in terms of like an impact level type number. And that this moment has actually removed um, uh, those numbers. So one doesn't have to respond to how many people came, which validates the importance of the project, which is what Blockbuster kind of um, shows and things are, are kind of like validated around those numbers. So I think that proposes like a different way of thinking around numbers, even when we are speaking to, to others. So we can now, I think, dictate what impact look like, looks like because it's no longer around how many people could come or saw um, a thing um, in, in, in real life. Um, and the other one is, I think in, in general around artists, is that there is often a heavy reliance on the 1% being able to buy art. And I think what we've kind of seen right now is that the 1% is hiding they're not buying art you know because in any case they were the, when they did go to those art fairs or blockbusters and all of these things it was more a social moment than it was like a, an ability to, um, or actually just seeing uh, exhibitions yeah over to you joseph 
just I think to respond in a slightly oblique and hopefully not to to abstracted way, and also also to again as to echo the, the thing about one of the moves is to think about how does one move resource to a much more local level? How does one um, devolve resources of different kinds um, to very micro local ecologies um, within the arts? Because that is really like the fundamental ground that needs to, that we're, in which you build, I think, um, anything like sustainability and re resilience. Um, the, the two other thoughts are, I think one of the things that I would really welcome, um, that I think would be great if it came out of this moment is for us to finally get rid of a certain kind of language, which is the language of sort of creative industries and creative economy. Um, and if there was ever a moment that kind of showed the absurdity of validating our field through that particular language and discourse, it is the moment that we're in now. Um, this is not to say that um, there should not be business and financial transactions and so on, but if the, the, the way in which that um, the the kind of currency of um, industry and a kind of transactional view of the field, how much wealth is it generating? Um, it, that seems to me is a, is a kind of conceptually very impoverished way of thinking um, about how we build a cultural field that we only invest in things that deliver some kind of economic mm -hmm. return that sustainability is measured in terms of financial, in terms of the financial viability of things. Um, and uh, a moment like this really shows um, the extent to which that is a kind of cul de sac in terms of building um, an institutional fabric around the field and building a field which, do, which um, um, is is able which which has a kind of strength and re resilience. Um, the the second um, question was which is linked to it is also somehow a revisiting, and this is very much I think internal to what we talk about of the arts and of culture and how we understand these things. But when we talk about what it is that we're supporting or trying to sustain, what are we actually talking about? Whose culture are we talking about? What kind of art and culture are we talking about? Um, and I mean, coming from, so I mean, I now work for the Swiss Arts Council. If one looks at the contemporary visual arts field, Switzerland is, as I often note, is the kind of heart of darkness of the contemporary visual arts field. You have a structure like Art Basel, which is at the center of a certain kind of economic mm, modeling of the field. I mean, if you visit Art Basel as a human being, you kind of feel that you've wandered into a pretty ghastly dystopian view of what art means and how it connects into the lived experience of, um, of, of people. Um, and I think, there are a lot of assumptions underpinning the institutions that we have, the museums, the art schools, and so on, about actually what, what it is that we're making, who we're making it for, in which context. Um, um, and it's, I think, as we know, it's, a, it's often a very excluding and very bubble-like um, construct. And we need to somehow, I think, move to something that is more porous and is more connected into the sort of lived experience of um, people. Yeah. So Notando, um, Kiza has a few questions, um, which I'll sort of put together. Um, Ganza has been and has tried to be the connective tissue to deal with some of the deep-seated sectoral issues. 
Um, this I realized when we actively asked the question of what Vanza does or what the organization's identity is. So I think that's more question around like, well, what is, you know, to speak of sort of like roles, um, what, what does Vanza do? <laughs> and what can we do, right? Um, and secondly, um, she asked that it's interesting to see the way in which Gabelo said people pose challenges to Vanza. Um, how will Vanza bridge the gap and bring the necessary people to the table to look at how and what could be done so that, so what is possible and how as stakeholders um, or how can stakeholders engage and get involved? Um, oh, I don't know who wants to take that. I think that's also a question to the audience. Like, how do you all want to get involved in Vansa? Um, showing up here is one element, which is beautiful and incredible. Thank you very much. Um, and I think there's, there's more that can still be done collectively. But Cabello Joseph Mulemo, um, you've also dealt with some of these challenges. Um, maybe you can speak a little bit to that. Um, I, can, I can go ahead. Um, I think that uh, part of the challenge of people getting involved with Vanta is not being fully clear what it does other than send a newsletter with opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting because um, actually in that newsletter, the, the newsletter starts off with everything Vance is up to. There's like a Vansa section <laughs> and then there's the opportunities. And I know before I worked at Vansa, I skipped that section and I just went straight to the opportunities <laughs> and like 90 percent of people do the same thing um and uh like we've we've tried a, a range of kind of communicative strategies and the information is definitely there if you if you want it um but i think mm. it's the kind of thing that might feel sort of intimidating to engage with so so vance has put out an annual report for i think the last five years or something which is quite a detailed sort of description of the work it does and its approach um and like the various projects but also advocacy programs the results of those advocacy programs and a few years ago there was a report on um the five-year strategic plan um within the, the annual report which said what you know this is what five years ago this is what we wanted to do and five years later this is kind of what we've achieved um and so so that information is out there i think there could be um better ways of communicating i know you you're working on sort of um ways of using other forms of technologies to, to get information out further than what say Facebook and a website can. Um, but I think there's also some stuff around sort of policy. Um, we did have a few sort of open sessions around policy and ask for contributions around policy, but I think that it can be a little bit um, overwhelming or intimidating. I think there's also a question of to what degree artists really want to spend their time working on policy. Um, so I think it's quite a specific thing that only some people would be interested in. But I think there is probably work to be done about making some of the work that Vanta does, which sounds maybe a little bit sort of specialist and intimidating, a little bit more accessible for those people who would want to, to get involved. Um, and I think that part of the, the difficulty of being a really small organization is you don't always know who your members are. Um, there are a couple of thousand, um, and particularly because Vance is based in Joburg, it's very difficult to know. Um, people across the country. Um, so Vansa does run a lot of programs and, 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 and there is quite a lot of um, coverage of other places in the country. But in terms of who these members are and what they might be able to offer, it's quite difficult to do when you just don't, don't know who's out there. Um, and there they, they could potentially be ways to better get to know who different members are, I think. Um, I think we could have done more of that when I was there. So... Um, I think it just relates to Ijoma's question, which I'll just read out and then maybe Joseph and Gabalo, you can respond. Um, so she says, my question relates to some of what Gabalo is speaking about um, or has spoken about. That is the investment in an ownership of Vanza by the, by the sector. Um, has there been more engagement and support from the sector over the years between Mulemo's directorship and Gabalo's? Um, and I think this is an aspect that has been lacking. That's what she says. So I think that's really broadly a question um, and linked to also Notando's question, really like how do we um, communicate the work that we're doing at Vansa, but also how does the sector get involved with what's happening in Vansa beyond it being like also 
and taking into account the overwhelming nature of policy <laughs> and these governmental yeah. conversations as well, right? Um, I, I guess the, the kind of quick answer is there hasn't really been, um, at least when I was there, a whole lot more engagement. But I think that there are just some things that we each deal with that are not, that, that don't just affect our practice. And I think that's a moment where one could go to Vanza with that type of information, whether it's something that you've written, whether it's some sort of conference that you're thinking around, or, um, I mean, the, this particular moment could have also been like the question of labor uh, or mental health or any of these things is a moment where if you know Vanza has done it, you can just email or call them or however you want to get in touch, write Facebook um, and say that either I'm doing this or what are you doing about this? Are you doing this? Can I get involved? I think some of it is just really people just coming through um, because even if Vanza says we're doing a survey, five people respond. I mean, <laughs> There isn't much you can do with that, you know, like, I think it's really, um, I don't know what it is that has somehow just doesn't make people feel like it's easy to, to access, but it's not from a lack of trying. I think people just need to know that they essentially need a Vansa. And so the more support you give it, the better. Um, can I do, do you want to... Yeah. One other thing. Yeah, go ahead. Do the shameless punt. I mean, one of the ways you really can support Vanta is by paying your membership fee. Oh, yeah. um, and I know that sounds deep, but it's really like it's a big deal <laughs> because um, a, lot of, a lot of members pay the minimum um, and it's an annual fee. It's really not a lot of money and people don't pay it. Um, it's eight rand a month. <laughs> yeah, and then come. I mean, even companies and some companies that you know have quite a bit of cash, they pay the minimum amount, even though we've like structured it that you can just pay sort of what you can afford. Uh, you also don't mm -hmm. have to pay once a year. You can pay more often if you felt like it. Um, and, and like it's, it's not a lot of money as a singular individual, but we've calculated that if everybody paid, it would actually be possible to run a, um, a, uh, a like a medical health uh, to arrange like a, an, a special arrangement with a medical health scheme for hospital care if everybody paid like it's literally it could be that powerful even though it's not a lot of money um and i think it, you know that that small little thing kind of speaks to how much you think Vansa can be useful to you but it also means that Vansa can be a whole lot more useful to you um and mm -hmm. and it's yeah now with the new website with like automatic updates with being able to pay online you know, there, there are people who walk to the closest town to pay Vanta membership at a bank and send us like the deposit slip. But then there's somebody who just do it on their phone who just doesn't bother, you know? And, and I think that is a very real way to, to contribute. That money can be used really well. Um, most of Vanta's money is held up in very specific projects. It's very specific programs and isn't very flexible. And so that mm -hmm. funding can really mm -hmm. go quite far if people contribute it. Um, just another thing is if you know, like now with the lobbying of um, artist resale rights, uh, which links also to what Mulemo was saying, often Vanza can't just, uh, Refilo can just get onto an aeroplane and go to parliament and represent the, the visual arts sector because when the money is like tight and, and there are people that we know in the arts that one could benefit from, like, we all can benefit from artist resale, right? Why don't you just tell Rufino, like, look, I'll buy you a ticket, go. Those, <laughs> those things, some of it could be that, you know? Um, it's just knowing that, like, I think we have to commit to or accept that Vanza works for all of us um, and where we can, we chip in. Yeah. Joseph, do you have any um, additional comments with regards to that? 
Um, no, not really anything significant to add to it other than to acknowledge that I think it's a perennial question for the organization. Um, and that there's a kind of balancing act, a complex balancing act between what the core staff of the organization, what their reading is of what is important or what should have priority um, based on their sort of aggregated knowledge of what's going on out there and um, where the needs seemed or the most, where the needs on the one hand reside and the opportunities exist on, on the other side. Um, and balancing all of that against what a whole, you know, what everyone else thinks. Um, and um, I, I think that the, the thing or one of the things that's very important for the organization to hold on to is a sense of exercising a professional and informed judgment on those, on, on exactly what those key issues are um, that need to be addressed in the short, medium and long term and not being too swayed by the sort of expression of immediate need and interest from any particular quarter, but be able to listen really carefully and thoughtfully to what people and organizations and institutions are, are saying. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I think at that at this point, it's kind of a good opportunity to share a little bit about what um, what Vanza is kind of doing, has been doing, um, just particularly in sort of response to COVID nineteen, um, but also like long term. Um, so at this moment, we did release a survey, um, and thank you to everybody here who did. Uh, participate um, and we'll probably do another one in about a month's time because that was really at the beginning of lockdown and things have changed quite significantly for many people. Um, we've also started the series of conversations which we hope will build and the next couple of ones will be really looking at institutions and how institutions survive, um, particularly sort of like smaller um, smaller ones that maybe don't necessarily have any kind of government support. Um, we're also looking at freelancers and artists across the board. Um, and then we're looking towards having um, our final one be like a, almost like a town hall um, and get everybody's voices in because we really do want to hear from you. Um, as has been mentioned, you know, there's things like the AGM and all of our emails are also on the website. So please reach out um, if you have ideas, if you have any thoughts or comments, um, if you want to just sort of like just say hi or keep up the good work. <laughs> <It's> also, <laughs> that is also really encouraging. Um, so with 10 minutes left, I wonder if there's any additional thoughts that you guys have um, as sort of closing comments um, from yourself, Mulemo, Joseph, and Gabalo. Oh, wait, there's one last question from Tato. Um, she says, perhaps there's a shift that needs to happen in the way that fans is perceived by artists specifically. My assumption is that, they, that many see it as simply a resource for opportunities. Um, the network side of things seems to be less valued from what I can tell. So as a suggestion here, the way in which artists use what Vansa offers as a kind of service um, does not necessarily extend to how dynamic needs to be encouraged. And Gwezi says in response to Joseph, I think there are two approaches which are not mutually exclusive. The one gestures towards a kind of industrial approach, while the other gestures more towards an, an anarchic <laughs> um, gig eco uh, ecology. Of course, it's always been extra hard because the art sector is not as highly organized as other sectors. But for me, that level of organization becomes important in precarious times. And it doesn't help that the government treats art as a hobby. So maybe you can sort of rope that into your closing statements. 
so we'll start with Cabello because uh, and and go the other way around since we began. <clears throat> I think the mic's off. Abela, your mic is muted. Oh, okay. mm. I'll have to Abela's unmute. Muted. Maybe Molemo, you will you will take us forward whilst I unmute. Okay. Uh, ooh, I wasn't ready. Um, I mean, I, I think uh, Tato's point is a good one um, around needing to develop a sort of more mutual engagement. Um, and I think, as Joseph says, it is a perennial issue that comes up probably every second board meeting. Um, and, and I think if people have um, strong ideas of how, how a kind of greater back and forth could work, I mean, just conversations like this very rarely happen. Um, and I think sort of really opening up the kind of internal mechanisms and conversations is, a, is even a start. Um, but yeah, I think, I think we have struggled to create more of an engagement with members and, and a large part of that is capacity. Um, but I think there can be very smart ways to do that better. Uh, I also think that Vance is quite an open organization. Um, despite being really small, it's always kind of been quite responsive and quite sort of um, willing to, to speak to even individual artists and respond to individual artists. And it gets emails from, we, we would get snail mail from people um, and we would respond sometimes also with snail mail. <laughs> um, and um, it's always been an organization that's very open to, to to helping in whatever way possible. Um, and I think that that's something that the organization continues to do and it's still very committed to, which is very special. Um, and I think, I mean, the one thing that, um, I don't know, Rafilio, maybe you can even comment on is that it, it doesn't seem like Vance is worried about closing down. This isn't a conversation going desperately, please can Vance get some support because it's going to be one of the entities that can't cope through this time. Um, and I think that's a that's a pretty good sign that at least it's not a, a total panic from day one because there are lots of associations and organizations that are not going to make it through this time. Um, and and I think, I mean, that's that's a good feeling to know that the organization has to some degree resilience and um, a strong enough leadership to pull it through this time and, and, a, and a great team. Um, Advance is very lucky to have a really, really strong team. Um, so, I mean, I, I think, yeah, um, I, I would say a big thank you to you guys. And um, I think there is a lot more opportunity for, and it's easier to say this on the outside now than I think it would have been from the inside, but there is a lot of, of opportunity to call more on the broader community of Vanta members um, for, for mm. our assistance and our help in various ways. And I think creating that, that sort of mutual exchange as, as Tago mentions um, can only make it stronger. That's it from me. Um, I'll, I'll jump in. So just in response to Kwesi, um, I okay. think I just straightforwardly agree with what he's saying, um, um, if I understand it correctly. Um, the, um, the two sort of closing thoughts from my side would be one is just I suppose reiterating something that I may already have said um, in in different ways but I, I think somehow for Vanza to use this moment where there is a kind of a certain amount of of chaos and flux in the national conversation around the arts and what should be done and what different um, what uh, what the institutional framework is that supports the arts and I mean outside of this one is aware that there is that there's a, a lot of movement and a lot of chaos in the conversation at the moment um, and I think for Vanza to enter that conversation as a kind of thoughtful voice of of some kind of reason um, and using this moment where things are quite up in the air where where the where it's clear that the traditional ways of working are not going to on are, are, are not going to be adequate um, to the demands and challenges of this moment. So there's a, a, a just reiterating the point that there's this opportunity to 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 influence a kind of institutional thinking, um, which could have which could have long term implications, and that opportunity. 
essentially give support to what I think Refillway is already doing on that front. Um, but not to underest underestimate the value and importance of what can sometimes feel like a very brain damaging <laughs> endeavor um, in terms of the kinds of meetings and so on that one has to sit through um, in, in order to get there. Um, the other thing is, I suppose, also one of my kind of hobby horses from my early times with Lanza, um, which is the sort of keeping animated and alive within the agenda of the organization, this continental agenda, um, and particularly in the context of a moment in which, well, on the one hand, a long moment in which we've seen a certain, um, certain kind of um, toxic nationalism entering our entering public discourse, political discourse, um, public life within the country, a kind of um, South Africa for South Africans kind of language and thinking. Um, and then in the context of a moment in which these national, the, 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 all of these national borders that are a kind of inheritance of a, of a long hangover of a colonial period are for the moment reinforced and buttressed once again. Um, and in what ways an organization like Vanza can respond to engage and engage with that in asserting a completely different kind of logic for how the cultural field operates and one that is not contingent on or respectful of, of these national borders. Um, and to, I think, um, yeah, for, for me, this seems more important than ever that the future of the cultural field in South Africa is intimately linked into the future of the cultural field in the region and the continent more broadly. Um, and that, that this should definitely not be a moment in which we retreat into some notion of a domestic South African agenda and kind of um, looking after our own interests as though they might, as though they are separate from the interests of people just down the road. Um, and a very last thing from my side, which is for me just to reiterate how special it is to be in this company of these three, um, of the three of you and to see how the organization has evolved and grown and strengthened um, under the leadership of, of each of you from being quite a kind of shambolic uh, and chaotic affair um, <laughs> during my time um, going in a multitude of directions all at once to, to something that feels more considered and shaped and precise. Thank you. Um, Gabalo, any last comments before we close? Um, yeah, I mean, I think I will also just reiterate what I already said, which is, I think this is a moment where we all can think about the type of um, uh, space that we're working in because what this virus has kind of done is disintegrated <laughs> that small little system that we're working in and so it's a moment to actually think around I mean it already wasn't working for most of us um, and so this is an opportunity to actually rethink what type of um, space we want to work with in and actually take seriously how that work is remunerated in, um, in a way that um, is considerate of where we live and how we live and what we need to live. So, um, and I, I don't think this is like, um, like I think Vanza is, is, is importantly a facilitator of that conversation, but not necessarily, um, it can just come, the answers don't, won't come from Vanza because Vanza essentially is us. So that would be, yeah. Um, yeah, and thank you for the invitation. Yes, thank you. So Vanza is us.
good way to end. Um, thank you everyone for coming through and please keep uh, a lookout on our social media and the newsletter <laughs> about the next of these conversations. And again, if you have any thoughts or ideas that you wanna share with us, please feel free to do so. Uh, we'll be sharing a recording of this um, so you can share with anybody who wasn't able to come through today. And thank you once again, um, whoever wants to switch on their video, just as a quick wave goodbye, <laughs> um, you can do so as well. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Rupilio. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye, everybody. <laughs>